So the human brain is um, a wonderful thing, um, and I try and use mine um, almost every day. Um, but it does have limitations. Um, it has limitations in the speed at which it can process things. And these limitations are actually really, really fascinating because they actually start to create a whole new world. And that's the world I want to tell you about today. But first, we have to go back and really understand the limits of strategic thinking within the brain. And there's some scientists that did an experiment on this. And what they did is they took a bunch of um, human test subjects and put them into an MRI um, machine. And when they were in the MRI machine, they projected images of chessboards with two pieces. And they asked them the question, um, is your king in danger? Is it in check? And as they did this, they tracked their eyes as they moved across the chessboard. And they also checked, there we go. They also tracked their brain as it lit up and they processed the signals that were coming in from their eyes. And as they did this, they also tracked how long it took for them to realize whether or not the king was in danger. And it turns out, if you're a non-expert, if you don't really play chess that much, it takes around 900 milliseconds for that information to go through your eyes, be processed in your brain, and for you to come up with a strategic decision. If you're an expert, it's a little quicker, but it still tops out at about 650 milliseconds. And at that 650 millisecond mark, it really represents the kind of the outer boundary of where humans can fundamentally participate in strategic thinking. And that's not a lot of time, it's about this long. But that little window has profound consequences because that's the window where algorithms start to dominate. And we look here and we see the growth of these algorithms as they get quicker and quicker and take more and more of this share of the financial markets. 65% of all trades and equities in the US are now done by algorithms. And these algorithms reside inside these machines. They reside inside servers that are connected together and they're connected together and they're located as close as possible to the exchanges so that they can get access to that information before anyone else. This is a world where the speed of light is something you have to factor into the equations you make. This is a world where the international exchanges are connected by undersea cables such as this one, where $300 million is being spent to shave five milliseconds of time so the algorithms can be a little more competitive with each other. This is a really interesting world. And it's a world, if you believe some people, that's had really big benefits. As the algorithms dominate, the bid spread, uh, the bid ask spread comes down towards zero. And this, this kind of system's almost perfect. Almost perfect all the time, or almost all the time. Because sometimes this happens. And for those of you that don't read financial um, charts for a living, this might be a little more familiar. This is the flash crash of 245. And this is the time when the algorithms between them kind of got together and made a decision that without anything really happening in the world, that we're going to take a trillion dollars of capitalization out of the global financial markets, that we're going to trade Accenture stock for one cent a share, and that Sotheby's was going to be worth about $100,000 for every share that it had out there. And then about 15 minutes later, they decided to go back to normal. And the thing is that today we are still pulling this apart. We don't fundamentally understand what went on during those half hour at 2.45 on that day when the algorithms got together and decided to play havoc with the global financial markets. And for me, I've spent a lot of time with algorithms. I find them fascinating. But I've got to tell you, they're also a little bit stupid sometimes. And I want to dive in today and take a little look and take you on a little bit of a tour around the world of algorithms. And so to do that, I want to kind of start with this timeline. And in this timeline, we've got at the one end, we've got scientific journals down here. They take about two and a half hours, if you're sort of good, to read them and process them. And you come down to this other end here, the 140 character tweet, the kind of the information that we tend to consume within the valley. And if you go much further beyond that, you end up at this sort of fundamental limit of human strategic thought, the point where we can't actually process information any quicker. And this is the world of the algorithmic ecosystem. And the algorithmic ecosystem, like I said, is dependent on the speed of light. And that makes it pretty cool. Um, the speed of light takes 65 milliseconds to travel from London to New York. A trade can be done on the NASDAQ exchange in 100 microseconds, where a microsecond is a millionth of a second. And they're developing hardware accelerated chips that will execute trades in 740 nanoseconds. 
Now, a nanosecond is sort of a little difficult for us to imagine because we're humans and we operate up here. But a nanosecond is the length of time it takes for light to travel this distance. 11.8 inches as light will travel in one nanosecond. And that's the kind of world that these machines operate in. It's not our world anymore. <laughs> it's one of the things we have to realize. It's not our human world anymore. It's the world of the machines. And this is what they look like. And the amount of time it takes a novice chess player to determine whether or not the king is in check, this has happened. It's like a foreign planet. It's a foreign planet with a lot of money, but it's not one that's really designed for us as humans. We don't really survive there. And it's kind of like this uh, sort of avatar reference as we kind of go out into it. So algorithmic trading. A subset of that is high-frequency trading. High-frequency trading, you can really break down into two different groups. Market makers, which set the price, and statistical arbitrage, which try and guess what's going to happen in the future. And we're going to focus a little bit on statistical arbitrage today. So a classic example of a stat arb trade would be what's called a pairs trade. And so in a pairs trade, you look through and you take the time series of one stock, and you convert that into a binary signal of zeros and ones, and then you look through all the other stocks, and you look at their time series, and you look for a correlation, or at least the algorithm looks for a correlation. And if it finds one, it starts tracking both of those two things together. And it does that because it's looking for when they diverge. And if they diverge, if that delta between the two prices starts to become too great, it jumps in and makes that trade. And it makes that trade. And if it's first to make that trade, it wins. And if it misses out because it's too slow, it loses. Another example of one of these algorithms is if you want to move a large amount of stock, say you want to move $200 million worth of GE stock through the market, if you do this, the market's going to respond badly. The price is going to get you know, reduced down. So you employ an algorithm to take the stock and kind of disguise it, to break it up into lots of small components, and then to convert this into kind of a swarm, a sort of a stealth object that will sort of swing past through the market unnoticed. And that's the idea. But of course, if you've got one algorithm out there making money, there's going to be another algorithm that's going to come and try and compete with you. And so what happens here is you have these other algorithms kind of sitting and waiting. And they sit and wait, and they're called sharks. And they sit in the way, they sort of ping. They sort of send out these little bids, and they look for a hit. And if they get a hit at, say, $24.50, maybe they'll change the price a little bit. Maybe they'll change the volume. And what they're trying to do is reverse engineer the stealth algorithm that has hidden the stock to try and find out if it is there. And if they get enough hits, what they do is they attack. And if they're successful with that attack, they make money, and the algorithm survives. This algorithm here is called quote stuffing. This is really, really fascinating. It's quite ingenious, albeit a little bit illegal. You take, <laughs> you, know, you know, as soon as people figure out that you can do this, it probably will be illegal. So A, a is an algorithm here. And what it's realized is that it's, it, it's cheaper, or indeed, um, it's quicker to generate noise than it is to make um, meaning from the noise. And so it basically stuffs the market full of quotes, fal false quotes. And it stuffs them through. And what that means is that every other algorithm has to go through each one of these things and go, is this real? These algorithms aren't very smart. They go, is this real? And in doing that, although it's just a small, small amount of time, it slows it down. And it gives A the advantage. A now has the speed advantage. Remember, this is a world where nanoseconds are important. And so this is really an ingenious strategy. And this is what it looks like if you look at it from the perspective of the algorithm. And here's another one a little smarter. And this is the world that they operate in. We don't see this but we can go back and look at it. And so these algorithms are sort of really, um, you know, they're not that smart. They're processing zeros and ones, the sort of the stock price and the stock volume. But they're getting smarter. They're starting to read words and starting to read sentences. And so this headline came out on Bloomberg on the 18th of the 8th, 2011. If you note the time, it was 12.08, 12 seconds, 0.679. Again, this is important. And it said, Hewlett Packard is said to plan spin-off of PC business. And this goes out and it hits the market. And this is what happens. Bang. The market jumps up 13%. It jumps up so much that it almost starts to kind of invoke circuit breakers because the market's moved too much. And it looks like it's happened instantaneously. But it's actually taken four whole seconds. <laughs> and this is important because that's about the same amount of time it takes a human to read a tweet. It's about the amount of time it takes a human to read a headline. And the thing is, in human time, that's pretty good. But in algorithm time, that's pretty terrible. And these algorithms are getting smarter because we are not simply quick enough. 
These algorithms are learning to read the news. And they're doing that because there's money to be made. And so when you pick up a newspaper or you, know, you read it on whatever device you will be reading it in a couple of years, by the time you've got to the first word in a story about a bomb exploding in Baghdad, the algorithm has already gone through and figured out the event. It's figured out the location, it's figured out the time, the intensity, it's put that into a model and it's traded oil futures before you've even had the page download. And this is the world where machines read the news and they know more about it than you do. But of course, if machines are reading it, they're probably also going to be writing it. And if they're going to write it, they'll probably also put noise out there just to confuse all the other machines. And you've got to wonder, is this your world anymore? Or is it the world of the machines? And so it turns out that actually if you let these machines kind of run out, you know, they do stuff, they kind of have these black swans like the crash of 245. And these things kind of seem like aberrations and we kind of get on with it. But actually um, there's another black swan that happens in the world of the algorithm. It's called the ultra-fast black swan. And the ultra-fast black swan happens on a time scale that humans aren't really aware of. It happens like this where a stock kind of moves along and then bang, it drops. Or a stock moves along like this and then bang, up it goes and back to normal. These are algorithms getting kind of stuck in little feedback loops, kind of generating noise, little micro fractures through the, the otherwise stable stock price. And there are actually 18,000 odd of these in the last five years, about 10 every day. These crashes are not kind of things that just happen once in a while. They are the normal situation when algorithms get together. And the reason for this is Cliff Asnes from the head of AQR said, a strategy is getting too crowded and then suffering when too many run outside the same door. And what he's really saying here is that this ecosystem has optimized for speed. And as a result, they all end up looking pretty damn similar. And when you have a bunch of species that all look the same, you end up sometimes in catastrophe. It crashes. These things are not stable because they're not that smart. It's an ecosystem that's, you know, to give it its credit, it's only about five years old. And so, you know, as we start to try and understand this, we maybe can um, draw on a little more experience from different other, different parts of the world. And it's lucky we actually have an ecosystem that's a whole lot older, the, um, the ecosystem of the Earth that we live on. And this is about 4.6 billion years old. And it turns out that we can actually study ecosystems within this, like the High Sierras. And we can look at the species, and we can look at the result of introducing a new species. You see up here, they introduce a new fish. And the gray species are the ones that suffer, and the other ones are the ones that prosper. And we can look at the predator-prey dynamics within these natural ecosystems and see what happens when we try and manipulate it. We've got a test bed, and we've got around 40 years of academic research into ecology and ecological networks. And this is the stuff that we need to draw upon. And this is a paper that came out just last month. And this paper, you've got an equation for stability in predator-prey ecosystems. The square root of SC has got to be less than D over sigma times pi, all divided by pi minus 2. And if you meet this criteria, you end up with a stable system. If you go past it, you move into instability. And so when you start pulling levers to dictate whether or not you're going to get stability in these algorithmic ecosystems, this is the kind of literature that we need to get our heads around. It's not to say it's going to be exactly like this, but they're a damn sight further ahead than a lot of the guys writing the algorithms. And this is important because if we sit down and take a look at this graph, and I'll give you a second just to kind of process. We've got this kind of weird behavior. You've got the price up the top, you've got the volume down the bottom, and it's trading natural gas futures on the New York Mercantile Exchange. And there's this algorithm that's kind of oscillating the price and it's moving up and down and the amplitude increases. And it's like it's searching for something. And you fast forward in time and you see what happens. It's been oscillating until the system breaks. The system breaks and boom, it drops about 10%. Then there are some trades made down here in blue and the price moves back to exactly where it was. And on one hand, this is pretty cool. This is an algorithm that's actually figured out whether by error or by design, it's figured out how to break a futures contract. That's cool until you sit back and you realize that this is natural gas. This is real natural gas. It's a commodity that's used to heat real people's homes that they depend on. And we've got algorithms that we don't understand operating on timescales that we can't conceive of, controlling prices of things that are in our world. And it starts to say, well, is it our world or is it the algorithm's world? 
And it kind of makes you want to push the button and say, let's stop all this. But I actually think it's too late for that. We've got a fundamental limit as a human beyond which we can't make decisions. So there's always going to be a niche in the global ecosystem for algorithms. And even if you got rid of algorithms from financial markets, are we going to get rid of them from the online ad exchanges? Are we going to get rid of the algorithms that serve up the, um, the, the status updates from your friends on Facebook? Algorithms are going to be part of our world. We actually got to figure out how to deal with them. And like all good ideas, they should come from movies. Um, and this is exactly the kind of thing that I think we need to start doing. If you want to go into a hostile environment, movies teach you you should have an exoskeleton. And that allows you to do things that are kind of superhuman and allows you to survive in places where you wouldn't otherwise be able to live. And so what's the software equivalent of a robotic exoskeleton that allow us to understand the algorithmic ecosystem that we don't get to inhabit? And there's been a lot of talk over the last few decades about artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is about the rise of the machine. And it sort of comes to a culmination when they talk about the, um, the chess match between um, Kasparov and Deep Blue. And for many people, when you know, IBM won that competition, that was the end of the story. But the reality is, there's a new style of chess out there called freestyle chess. And that's when humans and machines start working together. And it turns out that a human plus a machine will beat any machine in the world. So it's not so much about artificial intelligence but it's actually about augmented intelligence. And augmented intelligence is a symbiosis of machines and humans coming together to actually take control back of the world that we live in and say, actually, it's about us, and there's some real things going on here. And so I'll leave you this sort of sketch, and this is kind of how I see things and really what drives a lot of the work that I try and do. We've got a complex world on one side, and we use mathematics to make that simpler. And we've got simple humans on the other side, and we use tools like visualization to enhance our cognitive ability. And somewhere in the middle is a place where augmented intelligence lies. And if we can get that point, if we can find that space through the technology we create in this next decade, we'll be the ones that actually have dominion over the algorithms, and they'll be working for us instead of for us working for them. Thank you.